First Kings chapter 18, verse 43. We'll just read that one verse. Amen. First Kings 18, 43. And he said, this is Elijah, to his servant, go up now. <clears throat> Look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, there is something in nothing. Look at somebody else and tell them, in that nothing, there is something. Look at somebody else and say, in that nothing, there is something. Shake two hands or the third hand if you can and take your seat in the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I greet the church this morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I greet all the men this morning in Jesus' name. Can all the men say amen? Can I hear a better amen from the men in this house? I greet the women in this place in Jesus' name. I didn't hear you. Amen. Greet the brothers in the house in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we still have brothers now? Because <laughs> it, it seems like brothers have gone extinct and been replaced by prophets and apostles. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you are a brother, say amen. amen. Can I hear the ladies, the sisters in this house in Jesus' name? Hallelujah. They've been replaced by queens. Queening left and right. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Do I have sisters here? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God is great. For a few moments, let's look at the word of the Lord this morning. And again, I want to preface my message this morning by letting you know and reminding you that there is nothing God cannot do. And God is never out of time. Are you with me? God is never out of time. And God is never desperate. Are you with me? Issues of time pressure and desperation. Those are human reckonings. Because as humanity we live under the government of time and expectations. But God is never under pressure. And God is never out of time. There is nothing God cannot do are you with me now jesus told one man for with god nothing shall be impossible to him that believes and so as i come into the word of the lord this morning i want to say to you whatever it is that you may be confronted with god can find a way out for you the question becomes where are your eyes and where are your ears? And what is your mouth saying? Those are the determinants of whether you make it or die in a situation or become stagnant in one place. Understand that in this world we are constantly bombarded by information. Bombarded with information. There are things we are seeing. That's information. There are things we are hearing, that's information. There are things we are feeling, that's information. But there is another informant, if I may use that word, that you should be keenly and acutely in listening or in tune with, and that is the indwelling spirit of God. You have to choose your sources. 
You have to sift your sources of information. I want to ask you a question. Where do you get your information? Who is your source? When you speak, you are speaking because you heard what from who? When you see something, who is communicating? When you feel something, what is the source of those feelings? I say that to say this. Elijah, the servant of God, has just enjoyed a tremendous victory over the false prophets of Jezebel and Baal. We saw a mighty move of God. He went glory to God and called fire from heaven. A very brief prayer. You see, this is the beauty of obedience and faithfulness. When you walk in faithfulness and obedience, you don't have to convince God about anything. Because already you are walking within the framework or the parameters of the will of God. Your prayers are not an attempt to convince God to do something he is reluctant to do. Imagine having to call physical fire. We would assume that there is need to fast and to pray and to prepare for such a massive manifestation. But because Elijah has been walking in faithfulness and in obedience, he says... Hear me, O oh Lord, and let these people see and know that I have done all these things at your word. I wasn't doing these things because I can or because I wanted to. I did everything I did. I said everything I said because I was under instructions to do so. Why do you do what you do? Who told you to do that? Who told you to say that? Why did you go there? See, it's very dangerous to go where God has not sent you. And to do what God has not commanded you to do. Because God is not obligated to support what he has not authorized. God is only committed to what he has sanctioned. And so we come here and Elijah prays for fire. And fire falls from heaven. But keep this in mind. The people don't need fire. They need water. I'm going somewhere. Elijah comes onto the scene. And he prays for a manifestation of fire. And God responds in fire. And when the fire falls, the people fall. And say the Lord he is God. Now they know for a fact. Who between Baal and Jehovah is the real God. Through this mighty manifestation. Because before their need could be met. Their confusion and uncertainty had to be cleared. A lot of people have needs. But their felt needs are less than their confusion concerning the identity of God. Yes, you feel what you feel. Yes, you want and need what you feel you want. But that is not of primary importance. The primary question before we get to what you need is do you know God? So Elijah, first of all, settles the question of God's identity. Forget the rain. Forget the famine. Let's settle this one issue. Who really is God? Before he sends Moses, he settles his identity. Let's not worry about the signs and the wonders I am going to do in Egypt. Let's establish, first of all, who I am. And that's what Moses also understood because God told him, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to perform tremendous miracles through your hand. But Moses says, wait a minute. Before we get to what you can do, who are you? Listen to me. A lot of people can do a lot of things. But what people can do is never the issue. The issue is who are they? 
Are you with me now? So Moses says, I hear you. That you are going to do all these things. But tell me one thing. Who are you? When they want me to give them your identity. Who shall I say sent me? Elijah comes. To settle the same question. Because people were so backslidden. They couldn't tell the difference. Between Baal. And Jehovah, is this not the state of the church today? That people are so backslidden, so cold, so dry. They can't tell a satanic manifestation and a move of the Holy Spirit. They can't tell between the difference between a man of God and a charlatan. They can't tell the difference. Some people are subscribing to foreign altars, thinking they are following Jesus. When the truth of the matter is they are lost. So the, the, before we can get to what God can do, the question must be, but who is God? Elijah answers this question first. The God who shall answer by fire. Let him be God. And the fire falls. But we are not here because we want fire. We want this fair mind to come to an end. And this is the problem. Most people come with needs to God. And they walk away with manifestations. They get too prematurely satisfied. By what they see, the dramatic appearance of the power of God, but the truth of the matter is the power manifestation did not answer their question. You don't hear me. The, the, the manifestation of power did not settle their needs. They remain in need. They remain sick. They remain discouraged. They remain down. They remain defeated. But they saw a manifestation, but the rain still hasn't fallen. I like what Archbishop Ben Sedida Hosa did some years ago. He called a man, laid hands on him. The man fell down. And then he said, but listen, Jesus didn't come to make you fall. He came to make you rise. He came to make you stand. He was not diminishing the power of God. He was saying, listen, understand. The question here is not what happened during the service. The question is what happened in you and after the service. We, we can't have listened to me. The service must never be the highlight. Your life must be the highlight. Now, you, you should not refer to what happened in church. You should be saying what happened in church is what you see me as. I am what is happening. I'm not just what happened. I am what is happening. God that I encountered in church is the God in me now. He settled that question. Let Jehovah be God. But it still hadn't rained. And they sacrificed water. After this display of power, when people's hearts are now ready and receptive to this prophet of God, he tells King Ahab, rise, eat and drink, for I hear a sound of abundance of rain. See, when you walk with God, you hear the unheard. You hear what people don't hear and can't hear. You see what people can't see. Why? Because you live in two worlds at the same time. See, this is the beauty of the new birth. We were designed to live in two, birth, in two worlds at the same time. Adam in the beginning lived in two worlds at the same time. He lived in the garden of Eden, but he was also in the spirit at the same time. That's why I once made a controversial statement and said, I doubt Adam ever prayed. Why? Because he lived in that realm with God. God was not somebody he begged to visit. God was his friend and his father. He, he, he did not need Adam. You see, hear me now. 
Adam could never tell Eve, honey, let's now switch into the spirit. And, and Eve, while you are still in that spirit of prayer, honey, let's, no, 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 no. There was no spirit of prayer. Why? Because they lived in prayer. They lived in that realm of the spirit 24-7. There was no such thing as let's, let's now enter into the spirit. Where have you been? He said, I, I, I asked this, this, this question, I, I, I don't mean to be a clown, I don't, I don't mean to throw shade or anything, but, but I, I sometimes I wonder, and I, I understand what they're trying to say, you see people say, well now beloved, with your hands lifted toward heaven, let us now come into the spirit, where have you been? That, that's where you should have been all this time, why the Bible says that we should walk in the spirit, we should walk in the spirit, that's where we should be all the time, and Jesus spoke the same thing in John 3 verse number 8 concerning a man of the spirit. We should be men of the spirit. Just because I'm in a car wash doesn't mean I'm not in the spirit. Just because you see me at Nando's doesn't mean I'm not in the spirit. See, that's the problem. People think that there is a spirit realm where we enter and then when we are done with God, we resort back to our factory settings of carnality. We should live there. When you are in the shower, you are in the spirit. And you are not in the spirit because you are praying. You are not in the spirit because there is a slow song playing in the background. Even with V, you are in the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Please understand me. Because you've got to know who you are and where you are. We talked about this in the identity series. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is where we are. Jesus is our habitat. We are in him. Are you with me somebody? A Christian is somebody who lives in the spirit. Not somebody who visits the spirit. I don't have to be in prayer to be in the spirit. Prayer is what spiritual men do. Amen. Prayer is what men who are in the spirit do. Amen. Oh, you don't hear me. You understand me? Amen. And these mindsets, and, and uh, allow me to just say this, these mindsets can corrupt even your entire walk because even when it comes to sexual relations between husbands and wives, there's pe pe still people who feel like this is dirty. Or you can make love to your wife and be in the spirit. Amen. You know, now I'm a pastor. I counsel people. And sometimes I hear people say, well, after, or after this, then I, I feel dirty and I repent. Man, I said, why, why are you feeling dirty? This is your man. This is your husband. Why are you feeling dirty? Well, but, but why is that? Because of how we have been brought up. We, we believe that certain things, and believe you me, when they are outside God, they are. But once you are here in this realm, in this habitat, you are in Christ Jesus. You are in the spirit. It doesn't matter whether you are cooking or washing your car or sweeping the yard or making love to your spouse. You are in the spirit. You're not in the flesh. Adam knew. I'm a spirit man. God comes over here. He talks to me. He goes back to his house. Praise the Lord forever. Elijah says, get thee up. Eat and drink for there is a sound of abundance of rain. I hear rain. It looks dry all around. There is no cloud in the sky. But the prophet says, I heard something. I heard something. And hear me now. The Bible says we have believed. Therefore have we spoken. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 4.13 is by the Bible says we have the same spirit of faith that David heard. And therefore, because we have believed, we have spoken. How do I know that you believe something you say it? You say it. Faith will give you a mouth. When you've got faith, you speak. You can't be a man of faith and be quiet. When you, when you believe it, you are going to say it. I believe it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Let the weak say, 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 say. If they believe it, let them say it. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Say it. 
If you believe it. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be a world shaker. I'm going to be a generation changer. I'm going to be a great wife and a great mother. I'm going to be a terrific husband. I'm going to be an awesome daddy. Say it. Hallelujah. I'm going to be a great disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to make the rapture. Heaven is my home. Are you understanding what I'm saying? If you believe it, say it. That's why sometimes we are so defeated. Because people are out talking us. People are out talking us. People who say you will never make it are speaking a lot more than you are saying you are going to make it. You understand what I'm saying to you? People who are saying that you are nothing are out talking you and you are not countering their speech by saying I am somebody. I am something in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what you need to understand. If you believe it, say it. Say it. Don't keep quiet about it. Say it. So Elijah says, get up. Oh, please understand. This man believes it so much, he dares to tell the king, run. Can you imagine making the king run for nothing? This man believes in his word. He believes what he had so much, he is willing to jeopardize his life for what he believes. Tell the king, you better hurry. Because I hear in my spirit a sound of abundance of rain. Not just a little dribble, dribble there. No, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. Hallelujah. When you believe in a big God, you make big declarations. You make big pronouncements. You believe that there's not going to be just a drizzle. There's going to be a deluge. There is going to be a flood. There is going to be an outpouring. And I want to say to somebody here this morning, you better get yourself ready because there is a sound announcing your arrival on the global stage. There is a sound around announcing hallelujah. The turn around in your life. Things may have been dry and dreary until now. But I hear in the depths of my belly that your situation is about to change. <laughs> so I hear a sound of abundance of rain. And the Bible says the king got up. Settled his, 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 his horses, got on his chariot, and ran to Jezreel. And when he did that, Elijah went up the mountain. And he tells his servant on the mountain, go up and look toward the sea. Hallelujah. You understand what I'm saying to you? Understand when some people are engaged in the mundane affairs of everyday life, those of us who are kingdom tuned engage God in prayer. When kings go to eat, prophets go up to pray. Oh, you don't hear what I am saying. He just tells the king, listen to me. And I don't understand this now. One man's eating season is one man's praying season. He tells this king, now, listen, you better go up there and eat. But as for me, while you are eating, I'll be praying. And so when the king goes to feast, the prophet goes up the mountain to seek the face of God. And when he gets there, he tells his servant, go up, look to what the sea. And the man goes up and looks toward the sea and comes back and said, there is nothing. There is nothing. And that's where sometimes a lot of us find ourselves in a place where the report is, there is nothing. Hello? Amen. There is nothing. Financially, there is nothing. On the love front, there is nothing. In the ministry, there is nothing. In your family, there is nothing. Career-wise, there is nothing. Health-wise, there is nothing. I, never, I almost said, in your mind. But the Holy Ghost checked me. Hallelujah. There is nothing. Is the report and the experience of many. Hallelujah. But understand, Elijah is already too committed to receive no as an answer. You, you don't hear what I am saying. He is already in too deep to accept anything different. There is a place where there is no coming back. 
He has already said a word as a prophet. There is a sound that I heard of abundance of rain. He made that statement to a king. And then he told the king, run, go and eat. He is already committed. There are things he has sent ahead. And now he must go to the words he sent. I just said something right there. When you send words into your future, you better follow them. You better follow the things you declared 10 years ago. There are some things you said in 2018. That they went ahead of you into 2020, 2023. You better show up there. And so Elijah says, wait a minute now. You can tell me there is nothing. Uh, but hear me now. This is the beauty of it. Because isn't that what God loves to hear? I, I like it because that's the difference between us and God. Man doesn't want to hear there is nothing. But that's what God loves to hear. God loves to hear that there is nothing over here. Oh, we are all out. Our tanks are dry. Nothing is happening. Nothing is going on. Man, when he hears that, he becomes discouraged and despondent. But when God hears there is nothing. Oh, he begins to rub his hands. He begins to drool if ever God can drool. And say, yes, sir. That's exactly where I want you to be. Because when I begin to move, now you will be in no doubt. And you will not be skeptical or cynical. There will be no doubt as to who is at work here. Because you and I can both see and know that there was nothing happening before I showed up. Isn't this the same? Bible that says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse number two says and the earth was without form and void. The word void means there was nothing going on. Oh that's what God likes to see. That's what God wants to hear. He wants to look at somebody and see nothing. And then the Bible says upon that nothingness the spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. God likes it when there is nothing going on. He looks into the life of Abraham. He is living well in air of the Chaldeans. But God wants to do something through this life of Abraham. But Abraham has a lot of things. And so the God who wants nothing before he does something tells Abraham, get out of your father's house and go to a place that I will show you. Because I need you to have nothing and to be nothing before I make something out of you. Oh, you don't hear what I am saying. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God likes it when there is nothing. Because when there is nothing that God has an opportunity to do something in your life. Are you with me, somebody here? And so Elijah also begins to prophesy when there is nothing in the sky. And said, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. Those who need clouds to believe in rain could have looked at him like he's crazy. But Elijah knows you don't need clouds. You need God. And you need faith. In 2 Kings chapter number 3, reading from verse number 14, his apprentice Elisha told King Jehoshaphat and said, Hear this, but the word of the Lord is saying to me that you are to make ditches and dig trenches all over this valley. But there was no rain and there was no cloud. And Elisha said, For thus says the Holy Ghost, these trenches without rain shall be full of water. I want to tell somebody here, you may be faced by nothingness in your life. You are in a good place. You may be confronted by nothingness in your financial life. You may look into your situation and see nothing. Can I let you know that's exactly where God wants you to be? Can I say this to somebody? Sometimes we get in our own way because we want to be someone and somebody and something before God can use us. 
without understanding this that God never uses someone God always uses no one or you don't hear what I am saying anybody who is somebody when God meets them before God uses them he makes them nobody you don't hear me he sees Moses Moses is a prince in Egypt he is raised right he is a wealthy man but God knows I want to use this young man but my problem is he's rich he is wealthy he is too polished and so what does God do he sends him into the wilderness where he becomes a shepherd he used to have everything now he has nothing and he has nothing at all but God says now that you are nothing I can now make somebody out of you and God appears to him a former prince a former rich man and said Moses Moses and Moses doesn't know who's talking and said who are you oh glory to God he says I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob I've appeared to you for this purpose I needed you to become nobody before I can make you somebody let me say this to somebody here understand even when Jesus makes you someone what he really wants to do he wants you to take it upon yourself to make nothing of yourself can I qualify my point in first Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 9 Paul calls himself the least of the apostles years pass by in Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 8 he calls himself less than the least of all saints you can see he's becoming smaller and smaller even when God is making him bigger and bigger in 1st Timothy chapter 1 verse number 15 years later he calls himself the chief of sinners this man the longer time passes the less of himself he sees he began as the least of the apostles became the less than the least of all saints by the end of his ministry he called himself the chief of sinners in these days and age we begin as brother X then we become prophet X then we become senior prophet X then we become the bazooka then we become the archbishop then we become the cherubim rider but Paul began as the least of the apostles then the least of all the saints then the chief of sinners you are growing the wrong way in this kingdom we grow that way This man contains, has received two-thirds of New Testament canon, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, had by direct revelation, but he still says that I may know him. The more he knows, the more he realizes how much he doesn't know. You don't understand me. When you truly come into contact with this Messiah, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know and the more for you to need to know. You never get to a place, no matter how great the revelation you possess, where you feel like you know. His knowledge is meant to make you know that you don't know. The servant comes and says, there is nothing. Beloved, God wants us all in that place because in that nothingness there is something that God is about to do. The problem is many of us are fighting for something. We want something to happen. We want to see something. And sometimes God is saying, listen, I want nothing. I want you to get to a place where there is nothing. 
Because in that nothing shall I do something. When you are a man of faith, as the Bible says, we walk by faith and not by sight. In a nothingness is where we relish the opportunity to see God about to do something. God loves virgin lands. He loves virgin territories. He likes empty vessels because they give him a platform to fill them with himself. Oh, bless the Lord. He went to a wedding and he knew, listen to me, don't tell me Jesus didn't know. Jesus knew wine is going to run out. He knew they are going to come to a place where they have nothing to give people. He knew. They thought they're inviting a family friend. He knew I'm coming as a God who makes something out of nothing. And he went. They came to him and said, listen, Lord, they have no wine. Jesus told the mother, woman, my hour is not yet. Called the servant, said, fill the firkins to the brim with water. They had already been cautioned. Don't, don't process what he says. Just do it. Don't try to make sense of what he says. Just whatever he says. It doesn't matter how crazy it sounds. How disconnected from the current situation it is. Just do it. So when he says to them, fill the water pot with water. They just did it. After they were filled to capacity. The God of transformation. Are you with me now? Because this wasn't just a miracle. It was an introduction of the gospel of transformation. He says, now draw. No prayer. Draw. The miracle is in the instruction. The miracle is in the obedience. Too many people are waiting for God to move in something tangible or visible, not knowing that the miracle takes place upon obedience to the given instruction. Now, draw. And they took to the director of ceremonies and he took a sip and shook his head in bewilderment. Said, how come you have kept the best wine for last. Hallelujah. Are you with me somebody here? The servant comes, glory, and he says there is nothing. But the man of faith says go again. Why? Because I believe that contrary to your report, there is something. See, the, the man says there is nothing. The prophet says, I hear you, but go and check again. Because I know the God I serve. This is how he starts. He starts with nothing. We look at a life of Ruth. Before she can join the messianic lineage, she loses everything, including her home country. And God now positions her in the messianic lineage when there was nothing. He is a God who specializes in nothing. Never look at a situation in your life and write it off. Those areas in your life that are unproductive are actually the most potent. They're actually the most, they're, they're, they're actually the most fertile places where your miracle is often, listen to me, sometimes God hides plenty in barrenness. That's why he says in that same chapter, sing, O barren. 
For more are the children of the barren woman than of the married woman. Listen to me. Never look at anybody who has nothing seemingly going on for them and conclude she will never amount to nothing. He will never amount to nothing. Never walk into a place and say it's too dead. Nothing can come out of here. That's why there was even a saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because when everybody looked at that hometown, which wasn't even on the map, God saw a Messiah coming out of that place. Why? Because God specializes in bringing something out of nothing places. There is something. There is something in that marriage. There's something in that womb. Think about it. Sometimes doctors remove your womb. And a prophet says, I see you pregnant with twins. And you may be tempted to contradict him and say, prophet, you are not seeing too well. I don't have a womb. I say, listen to me, woman. I see you pregnant with you. Why? Because this God is a God who specializes in nothing. I remember a man who had no eardrums and after prayer he could hear and he wasn't so shocked that he could hear. What blew his mind was that doctors kept on saying, you still have no eardrums post the miracle. Because he expected that after my healing, it should mean God has restored my eardrums. But when he went to the doctors, they told him, you still don't have eardrums and that blew his mind even the more. Are you here? Amen. There is nothing. There is something. You are in a good place. I know it doesn't, it's not encouraging in the natural. When you look at certain places. And you look at how long you've been there. And you conclude there is nothing. But Elijah says, go again. Go again. I like to use this example. There are many married women, married men, who went to propose love to their current wife, and there was nothing. <laughs> and they came again, two weeks later, and there was nothing. You understand what I'm saying to you? They came again, six months later, and there was nothing. But two years later, they were walking down the aisle. Because the men of God did not receive the report that there is nothing here like wife for you. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? Amen. Anyway, maybe that was all in the, in the olden days. Nowadays things are easy. Nowadays things are so easy. Nowadays women don't make men work at all. That we don't work hard at all. <clears throat> you understand me? Hallelujah. They, they don't make it so easy. In fact, sometimes they come. They don't even wait for you. Overtake. Possess your possessions. For since the days of John the Baptist until today, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and violent women take it by force. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody said there is something. It doesn't matter what the devil communicates to you. God specializes where there is nothing. But look at the Bible. Some of the most significant men of God in the Bible came out of wombs that were written off. There was nothing in Rebecca, but Isaac came out. There was nothing in Sarah, rather. 
But Isaac came out. There was nothing in Rebecca. But Jacob came out. There was nothing in Rachel. But Dan came out. Reuben came out. There was nothing in Elizabeth. John the Baptist came out. Mary was a virgin. Meaning there was no human seed. But Jesus came out. There is nothing. No. There is something. There is something. In that situation. There is something in that little prayer. There is something in that one day of fasting you took to seek the face of God. It may look like nothing, but there is something. There seemingly was nothing in the widow's offering, but there was her life. There was something in that offering. There is something. The problem is most of us are too quick to quit and look elsewhere. Not knowing, right here, there is something. Elijah knew. Said, go again. The man came back, said, there's nothing. Said, go back again. The man came back and said, there's nothing still. Elijah said, no, go back again. I'm already in too deep. I'm too committed. I can't come out now. There is no divorce in the realm of faith. I'm married to my answer. You understand? The Bible says God hates divorce. I'm not going to divorce my answer. I'm too committed. I've already made a faith proclamation. I will not divorce my commitment. Go again. The fourth time came back, there is nothing. Said, no, 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 no. That's not how I roll. I don't know about you, but go back again. And the man went back, came again the fifth time, and said, There is nothing. And Elijah said, Listen, boy, don't you play with me. You are, you are too used to be my armor bearer. Don't play like that. I said, Go back and look again. And the man said, I can imagine the man now come. Can you imagine? He said, we, we don't know the converse. He could have said, Prophet. You, you're a great man of God. You're great. If God doesn't send rain, I will, stop, I will not stop believing in you. Everybody knows that you are a great man of God. We just saw fire for crying out loud. I, I believe you, Papa. And I will follow you, even if it doesn't rain. But please... Elijah, go again. And the man went back. Hallelujah. And came back and said, It's better than nothing, but hey, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, Hallelujah. We better get down this mountain. There is something. I told you there is something. Oh, bless the Lord. And the man could have said, but maybe you didn't hear me. I, I, I said it's like the size of a man's hand. God, the Bible says if you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be uprooted, be thrown into the sea, and so shall it be. We don't need a cumulonimbus cloud. You don't need a massive cloud to believe in a thunderstorm. All I need is a fist, and the fist is all I'm wanting working with and I'm good to go there is something after all I remember watching Dumb and Dumber oh glory to God one of the greatest comedies of all time Dumb and Dumber and Jim Carrey was talking to this pretty pretty woman hallelujah hallelujah some of you who have seen Dumb and Dumber you know glory to God how Jim Carrey my goodness he was dumb like he was dumb 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 but he loved this girl and he believed that he had a chance and he drove all the way to Aspen, Colorado to look for this girl and then one day he took, he bit the bullet he came into contact with the woman and said listen girl I want to ask you one thing just give it to me straight what are the odds of you and I being together give me a number one in ten, one in a thousand, one in a million. 
And the lady looked at him and said, one in a million. But what I loved is that at that moment, Jim Carrey smiled and said, so there's a chance. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? He says, so there's a chance. Glory to God. There is something. She, and, and you know, the weird thing is that after the shooting of that film, in real life, he married that woman. Don't tell me he's not a prophet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you here? Never believe that there is no chance. You may lose your job, lose your friends, lose your money, lose your car, lose your dogs. Seemingly looking like you are smelling. Nobody wants to do anything to do with you. Where you are in a place of nothingness. Sometimes in that very space, get excited. Because that's a sign. God is about do something. Job said this. I look to the left. I can't perceive him. To my right, I can't feel him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Some of you are feeling like you are in that space. There is nothing. You are praying, there is nothing. You go for interviews, there is nothing. Hands are being laid on you, there is nothing. Oil has hit your life, there is nothing. People are walking away, there is nothing. Listen to me, look again. There is something. And out of you being a nobody, God will make as somebody it says rejoice oh you barren and I've said this I think it was on the crossover you don't rejoice when you are pregnant you rejoice still in that barrenness while you are waiting for God to open the door you've read the meme dance in the hallway you don't dance because the door is open because you know it's going to open the report of the world and the devil is there is nothing. But God's report is there is something in nothing. There is something in nothing. Martha told Jesus, if you were here four days ago, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The funeral was four days ago. But when I show up, there will be life out of that sepulcher. There will be life out of that tomb. The great widow of Zarephath had everything but a child. The prophet said, next year this time, out of nothing, you will hold a baby. Are you with me? God is a God of something out of nothing. The disciples say to him, we toiled all night. There's no fish here. Jesus said, let me use your boat. We'll get to the fish later. Preach the gospel to the people. Turned around, said, launch out a little deep. Same lake, same waters, just a little bit further. Cast your net on the right side. When they have done so, they enclosed a great catch of fish, the likes of which they had never seen before. There is fish in that lake. Just because you haven't caught anything so far, doesn't mean you should jump into another lake. There's fish there. Because this God is a God who brings something out of nothing. He wants to hear you say there is nothing. So that he can show you there is something. Stop contending to become someone. Allow yourself to become no one so that God can make someone out of you. Amen. This is how God works. 
Paul told the Corinthian church, look amongst yourself. Not many of you were great and noble, but God has chosen the foolish things the weak things, the things of no consequence in this world to shame the strong. Beloved, there is something there. There is something there. Hallelujah. There is something there. There is something there. You understand me? There is something there. That brother who seems like he's not gotten his life figured out, there's a man of God there. There's a husband there. There's a father there. That sister who doesn't seem to do her hair. There's a wife there. There's a woman of God there. There's a mother there. There's something. Are you with me? There's something. Don't overrule and write off something because in the natural it doesn't look like it. Uh -uh. There is something. Listen. In motor vehicles, this is my last statement. In cars. They've, caught, they've got cars they call sleepers. A sleeper is a normal car with an engine that is different or souped up. For instance, you can drive a Ferrari 488 Pista. Right? Top speed, 350 kilometers an hour. Everybody knows a Ferrari is fast. And then you can have a sleeper, an Audi A3. And soup up the engine or put a Hellcat engine into the Audi. Now, when you are driving on the highway, the, Audi, the, the Ferrari person will take it for granted that they will be faster than you. Not knowing that your car is a sleeper. The reason why they call them sleepers is because there's nothing to it, it's a normal car. What you don't know is that there is speed sleeping here. There is power sleeping here. There is something. One of the, the videos that shocked me ever in life was a, uh, what, what is this car? Nissan, Nissan Patrol. Nissan Patrol. In, is it Dubai or Saudi Arabia? Dubai. Nissan Patrol. Nissan Patrol. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And have you seen a Nissan Patrol? Yeah. Nissan Patrol is an SUV. Yeah. Nissan Patrol. Mm -hmm. And it was racing a Porsche 918. Now a Porsche 918 is one of the fastest production cars in the world. Yeah. And the Nissan Patrol. <laughs> when the lights went green, the Pathfinder was gone. The Patrol was gone. The guy in the Porsche What am I saying? Beloved, God has sleepers. There is nothing. You, you look at him or her, seems like there is nothing. Just an Audi. Just a Corolla. Just a Mercedes. This is a Rolls Royce. This is a Bentley. Yeah. Not knowing there's a sleeper here. There's a sleeper. Most of you have watched the Fast and the Furious franchise. Most of the cars they use are not your brand fast cars. They don't use Ferraris and, and Lamborghinis and Bugattis. They use your Nissans uh, and, and Lexuses and all of those things. The only difference is they soup up the engines. And in this normal car, there is something. Never look at anyone or your life. And never allow anybody, even notice this now, that is the person closest to Elijah who told him there's nothing. We tend to trust those closest to us the most. But sometimes the closest people to you are giving you the wrong feedback. What they are telling you is inconsistent with what you believe and what you have declared. The man closest to Elijah, who even see him in his prayer closet, engaging God. Listen, Elijah prays. The servant says there's nothing. Don't take everything from someone just because they are the closest to you. What is your confession? What have you declared? What have you spoken? 
believe that once your faith is engaged, there is something. Never abort your confession. You don't hear me. Never abort your confession. Abortions don't just take place in wombs. Christians are people that like aborting. You begin to engage God in a project. When it got hard, you quit. You've aborted your mission. Once you declare rain, don't abort. Once you pronounce revival, don't abort. Stay there. Why? Because there is something in that nothing. Let's rise on our feet.